All right, here we are, week five, Old Testament. We're getting into the books of Joshua and Judges this week. Uh, these books actually open up a whole new section of our Old Testament called the historical books. Uh, these books uh, are everything from Joshua up to Esther. And basically what they do is they chronicle the history of Israel in the land, in the promised land, in Palestine, or what is initially known in the Bible as the land of Canaan. Those are all terms used to describe that area on the earth. Now, um, most of you probably remember that Israel has come up out of the land of Egypt. They are now on the verge of going into the promised land when the book of Joshua starts. And what I want to do is kind of give you an overview of the history of Israel just so you can gain some perspective. And, me, and in me giving you this overview, there's a term I want you to keep in mind or variation of this term. It's called Deuteronomistic History or the Deuteronomistic Cycle. We're going to be looking at that in depth. Uh, that is kind of the framework or, or the lens through which you view the history of Israel in the Bible. And here's what it is. I think it's on page 90 in your textbook, but basically what it is is it goes back to Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28. And this is a very simplistic overview of what's stated. Basically, God is making His covenant with His people. And He's telling His people, look, if you're faithful to Me, if you're obedient to Me in the land, and you're giving Me uh, acceptable worship, I'm going to bless you in that land. You're going to prosper. However, if you're disobedient, you're unfaithful, and you start worshiping other gods, things are not going to go well for you. Okay, And that may be a little bit oversimplified, but basically that's what you see in Deuteronomy 28. Now, this is what you're going to see play out in history. Uh, basically, from Joshua all the way to Esther, you're going to see that play out. You're going to see that type of history, um, excuse me, that type of history play out. Uh, so when you get into the book of Joshua, uh, and I may, I may throw some dates out there. Now, when I start throwing some dates out there, I want you to understand that in this overview that these dates are um, very round numbers. Uh, and scholars will debate on you know, how accurate these dates are. Scholars will debate on when certain events actually happened. We're going to go with a timeline that best kind of fits the biblical narrative. Okay, uh, And so, if you remember, we've come up out of the land of Egypt. Um, with Moses, uh, and that happens around 1440. They wander in the land for uh, 40 years. And so here we are on the edge of the promised land in the book of Joshua. And I want to focus on Joshua and Judges in this overview since those are the books you're going to be reading this week. Um, and so here we are in the book of Joshua around 1400 BC, 1400 years before Christ. You see that they're standing at the edge of the promised land. Moses has died. Uh, Joshua, Moses' right-hand man, is now the successor. And um, here's how the Deuteronomistic history initially plays out. Um, they are going to go in and they're going to battle um, the people in the land of Canaan. Now, these people, basically, there's not a unified nation at the time in the land of Canaan. It's basically a bunch of city-states that are kind of speckled throughout all the land, and you have um, you know, kings or rulers over specific city-states. Uh, there's really no unification. Now, at one time, Egypt and the Hittites had kind of fought back and forth over this piece of land and kind of controlled it, but both of them are at a very weakened state at this time, uh, basically because of that continual fighting. And so these, this area is kind of um, you know, ruled by the individual cities. Um, they're, they're, they're kings over specific regions and cities that are ruling. And Joshua is basically going to go into the promised land and he's going to try to pick these cities off one by one. And the first one he goes into is, uh, according to the Bible, one of the biggest and the baddest cities there is, and that is Jericho. Uh, Jericho has these massive walls. He's going to go into this city, uh, go into this land, and he's going to Basically, you know, like a kid going onto a playground, picking a fight with the biggest bully on the playground and punching him in the nose. That's what Joshua is about to do. Uh, and they fight this battle in a very unconventional way. Um, basically, they're going to obey all the commands of the Lord, and they're going to basically circle the city 
uh, for seven days and seven times on the last day. And they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant when that happens, uh, which represents the presence of their God. And as they do this, they let out, or towards the end, they let out a huge uh, shout. They lift up their voices. They blow their trumpets. Uh, and the people are ready to invade the city. The walls come crumbling down. And God gives them a wonderful victory. Very unconventional, but a victory to say the least. Um, they, there is, uh, at this time, this is where God actually um, institutes what's known as the ban. Uh, now, the ban or the holy ban is basically where God tells his people, everything that you conquer in this city, um, every th all the spoils of war, so to speak, they're to be given to me. Uh, and what this was was an acknowledgment by the people that everything given to them is given to them by God. And we're giving you this part to acknowledge that and to acknowledge our appreciation. That was the idea behind this ban. Well, there was one guy named Achan who does not uh, adhere to this ban and ends up hiding a bunch of uh, nice stuff up under uh, up in his tent. And um, they go to conquer the next city named Ai. Ai is no ways as big as Jericho. Um, not really a threat, so to speak. They figure they can take it relatively easy. Uh, they end up getting their butts handed to them. They're coming back. Jo excuse me. Joshua's wondering what in the world's going on. Joshua finds out that this guy named Achan has, um, you know, disobeyed God. And again, this is the Deuteronomistic history at play. They're disobedient. What happens? God brings a defeat to them. Okay? And then you're going to see... Um, Throughout the remainder of the book of Joshua, um, you're going to see mostly Joshua conquering these uh, city-states one by one. There's going to be some hiccups along the way, but that's basically what's going to happen. Now, admittedly, uh, it's somewhat mixed. The message in Joshua is a little bit mixed. Because on one hand, they're going to make statements like, Joshua conquered all the promised land. Thus, Joshua conquered the land. And then in the very next breath, you're going to see that the, the Bible indicates there was still some land yet to be conquered. Uh, and so, you know, some may not be sure what to make of that. Okay, so did he conquer it all or did he not conquer it all? And, and maybe what the writer has in view is that Joshua gains a firm foothold in the land. Um, Joshua goes in, he takes out a lot of the major city-states. Yes, there are still some city-states left. There are still some uh, people uh, who are the original residents and inhabitants of the land still left. Uh, but yet they've conquered enough to gain a firm foothold to establish themselves and to begin to divide up the land, which is what the end of Joshua is actually about, the division of the land to the different tribes. Okay, Unfortunately, Joshua is going to die. And Judges starts out with this kind of uh, uh, somber statement, really. It's kind of a statement, statement that will um, indict um, the nation itself. Uh, Joshua dies in his generation, and another generation arises that did not know the Lord or the works he had done in Israel. And so what you have in Judges is this huge indictment against a nation that is spiritually confused and politically chaotic. Okay? Uh, Judges is a, um, it's actually like a huge soap opera. This book is kind of, I, I like it. It's one of my favorite books. It's a very real-to-life book. Uh, when you look at Judges, you're going to see this Deuteronomistic cycle play out. Uh, and this is, um, and here's what I mean by the cycle. Again, the history is this. If you do good, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you in the land. If you don't do good, you're going to find trouble. Uh, and you see this play out very clearly in the book of Judges. Now, in the book of Judges, one of the things that you see is that you see that the people are not really the people of Israel. They're more devoted to their tribe, and they're more devoted to their area than they are the land as a whole and so you don't see the people really united you see the kind of the different tribes struggling individually with the people who are in the ha the inhabitants of the land the people that they have failed to drive out after Joshua has died they're struggling with that um, 
another phrase you're going to see constantly in the book of Judges is this phrase. Um, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Again, this is an indictment of the political chaos. So there's religious confusion and corruption, and there's political chaos going on in the book of Judges. And again, the, here's the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomistic cycle. Israel is going to sin, or the individual clans or tribes, they sin. God punishes them. They cry out in repentance, and then they are restored by God raising up a charismatic, usually a military leader, uh, to uh, help deliver them, so to speak. And that's the word deliver is used a lot in the book of Judges. Uh, and you'll see that um, what happens is, you know, Judges kind of follows this little, uh, I don't know if you can call it a pattern, but you basically have Judges where initially they're, the stories about these Judges are pretty short and to the point. Uh, you know, there was such and such a Judge, God raised him up, you know, this was the issue that they were facing, and God uses that judge to deliver the people. There wasn't a lot of detail to the story, and there wasn't a lot said about the judges individually, and usually not anything bad said initially. Uh, and as you go progress, you're going to find more and more detail, uh, detailed stories, and more and more details about the judges specifically. And some of these judges aren't all that great till you get to one of the last ones, Samson who, you know, character-wise is a horrible individual. Uh, nothing like you would want your a leader to be, um, even though he's probably the most popular person in the book. Um, so um, one of the things you're also going to see, like I say, is you see the spiritual corruption and the political chaos. And, and so let me just give you a story out of Judges um, that kind of illustrates this. Um, there's a a Levite who leaves to go and retrieve a runaway a runaway slave girl who has run away to her father's house and he goes and retrieves his slave girl which that shows you there's some problems to start with uh, and on his way home he try he stays with this guy in uh, the area known as Benjamin uh, which is you know where the tribe of Benjamin had been allotted some land. He stays in this area, and when he st he stays there, there are some men of that city who come and surround that area. And of course, this is kind of reminiscent if you go back to uh, when Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Um, it's a little bit reminiscent of that. Um, but there, these men surround the area, the the house of this older man that has taken the Levite and the slave girl in. And they demand that the older man send this Levite out so that they can have sex with him. Um, the Levite is obviously a little squeamish about this. And uh, so he sends the slave girl out. He gives the slave girl to him, to them. And uh, in doing so, they rape her repeatedly and they leave her for dead on the doorstep the next morning. Uh, and again, I think a Levite who is supposed to be one of the spiritual leaders of Israel, uh, you see... This is an indictment. This story is an indictment against the corruption spiritually, the confusion spiritually that is going on in Israel at the time. Uh, again, politically, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Everybody's doing their own thing. Samuel uh, will later make First Samuel will make the comment that there was, you know, there was no vision, no direction for the nation. Everybody's just kind of doing their own thing. Um, so that's really what characterizes the book of Judges. It's really kind of a sad book. Like I say, it's kind of a soap opera type book, but it's really kind of a sad book when you look at the victories that were won in Joshua and pretty much the tragedy that you see in Judges. Uh, now, you move from Judges into 1st, 2nd Samuel. Uh, Ruth, I think it's between those books. Ruth actually takes place during the time period of the Judges. Not sure where. Uh, so that book can actually be put within a time period of the Judges. It's kind of like a story extracted from that time period. Um, now, first, second Samuel, we're going to see a guy named Samuel, a prophet, um, who is raised up, and he is known as the last judge and the first prophet, so to speak. And um, he is going to be a prophet that actually transitions Israel into a kingdom with a king. They're going to go from being uh, what's known as a theocracy. Samuel does a great deal of work to kind of unify 
the tribes, uh, and in doing that, that kind of prepares them to get a king, to to receive and to be able to accept a king over the whole land, rather than the tribes operate independently. Uh, and so he'll kind of prepare Israel for that and usher that in, uh, probably unknowingly, because uh, he really wasn't that keen on the idea of a king. Uh, he, he really wanted God to be the king. Uh, and the first king is Saul, and then comes Israel's most famous king, David. And a lot of his fame came from his epic battle against Goliath. And just to kind of give you dates here, um, you're looking at 1440, Moses up out of Egypt. 1400, Joshua's conquering the Promised Land. And then you got about 400 years of the judges after Joshua dies. You got about 400 years or so of the judges. Um, and uh, of that dark period. And then around 1000 BC, you have David comes to the throne. Okay, David comes to the throne. He expands the kingdom through warfare and military tactics. And uh, towards the end of his reign, he is wanting to build God a temple. Up to this point, God. Um, basically is worshipped at a place called Shiloh and that's where the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness that's where that tabernacle is placed that's where the Ark of the Covenant is said to be is in that tent area that tabernacle and David wants to build a more permanent place um, he's not allowed to do so by God but his son Solomon who comes after him will build the temple uh, he will expand the kingdom even further by diplomacy usually by marriage. He marries numerous women. Um, and then Solomon, actually you'll see in his life that he finds, you know, Solomon is um, going to be led astray by foreign idols and you're going to start to see trouble arise. Again, remember Deuteronomistic history. Solomon is led astray. As the king goes, so goes the nation. You start finding the worship of other gods pretty commonplace by this time. After Solomon dies, there's some tension that already existed between some of the tribes. That tension kind of erupts, and the kingdom splits between the north and the south. Okay, so when you read the book of um, you know Second Kings and then First Second Chronicles, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to see that the Bible talks about really, and you got to kind of keep that in mind when you're reading those books. There are two separate kingdoms as far as Israel goes. The northern kingdom is known as Israel. And then the southern kingdom, which is made up of Judah and um, I think Benjamin, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, mostly Judah. Uh, that southern kingdom is known as Judah. That's where uh, Jerusalem is, by the way, and where the temple is. So you have the northern kingdom, Israel, known as Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. Okay, That's after Solomon's death. And so you have kings in the north and the south. You have a king, you know, just like in the United States, we had a, you know, during the late 1800s of the Civil War, you had, uh, you know, we had a president in the north, Abraham Lincoln, and a president in the south, Jefferson Davis. So, you know, that's basically what you have going on in Israel. You have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Now, the Bible usually um, kind of gives you an overview of each of these kings. Now, none of the kings in the north were good. Generally, the kings, uh, the northern kingdom is kind of put off as a, uh, you know, they're just not as faithful as the southern kingdom. They're, they're more apt to worship uh, foreign gods. They're more apt to kind of go their own way, do their own thing, try to make alliances with other nations than the southern kingdom is. Okay, as a result, uh, again, Deuteronomistic history. What happens? They're, you know, disobeying God. They're being unfaithful. A, a nation named Assyria comes down and they invade the northern kingdom. They destroy the northern kingdom, take its people captive. Okay, and you know Israel, the northern kingdom, is essentially punished uh, again along Deuteronomistic lines. Okay, um, now when you look at their history, none of their kings, all their kings, there's this phrase used uh, by the kings that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. There were no good kings in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, I think they had a few, two or three good kings. Uh, they had Most of the rest of them did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But there were some who did what was right in the sight of the Lord, uh, which seemingly maybe prolonged their punishment, their Deuteronomistic punishment. 
Uh, but it would come. They would continue to rebel. God would send prophets like Jeremiah, for example. Uh, even though his book is kind of you know on past these, um, Jeremiah exists towards the end of the Southern Kingdom's reign. Okay, and uh, he would warn. Look, you've got to turn, again. He's going back to that Deuteronomistic history. You've got to turn back to God. You're being unfaithful. He's promised. If you will not turn to me, you will be punished. You're going to be taken captive. And specifically, Jeremiah is speaking of this new kingdom that has arisen, this kingdom that conquered Assyria. Jeremiah is warning that kingdom, Babylon, will come and he will con they will conquer us. They're led by a general named Nebuchadnezzar who will eventually become their king. Around 5, so 720s, the northern kingdom falls to Assyria. Around 580 something, 586 I believe, the southern kingdom will fall to Babylon. Uh, the temple and Jerusalem will be destroyed. All the temple elements will be taken back to Babylon. God, um, Nebuchadnezzar will actually deport a lot of the main citizens of Israel uh, or of Judah and Jerusalem back to Babylon. You'll see people like Ezekiel and people like Daniel and some others that are actually deported to Babylon. Uh, and they will stay there. They will remain there. The Bible says it's a period of 70 years that they remain there. Uh, so you got somebody like Daniel, who's probably in his late teens, early 20s, goes to Babylon, and he'll be there for 70 years up until he's in his 90s. Okay. Um, then uh, another kingdom comes on to, on the scene, uh, a kingdom uh, or an empire that originates in what we know of as Iran today, known as Persia, and the Persian king Cyrus the Great will conquer Babylon at around 530-something, I believe. They conquer Babylon, and Cyrus allows the Jews to return home, or the Hebrews to return home. They return home under the leadership of folks like Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra will return home, and he will start you know, rebuilding the temple and things like that. Later on, Nehemiah will come, and he'll start rebuilding the city and the walls. And you'll see prophets that come along during this time, like Haggai. He comes along during this time, and he encourages the people to keep rebuilding the temple. And uh, eventually, you'll see kind of the close, what we know as the close of the Old Testament during this time. Okay. Um, now, also, Esther. Just let me make a brief mention on that. Esther is a queen that is a Jew in a foreign land. So while some... Uh, Israelites came home, and or Hebrews came home, or Jews, you know, whatever you want to call them, came home and started rebuilding their cities. Some still stayed in the foreign lands. Okay, Esther is a story of those who stayed in the foreign lands. Uh, she is a queen under Xerxes. Uh, some speculate this may be the same Xerxes who fought the 300 Spartans, uh, so to speak. You know, some of you are familiar with that story. Um, she is queen under him, uh, and her story is a story of the Israelites in foreign lands uh, as they have been taken captive. So that's basically an overview. Real quick, just so you get an idea of timeline, 1440, Moses up out of Egypt. 1400, Joshua into the Promised Land. Around a thousand, the kingdom is established under David. Again, Saul was first, but David really is known as Israel's greatest king. He's the one that unites the tribes. He's the one who expands the kingdom. Uh, so that's around a thousand BC. Okay, and then around 720, uh, the northern kingdom is destroyed by Assyria. Around 586, the southern kingdom is uh, conquered and deported by Babylon. Around the 530s, Babylon is conquered by Persia uh, and the Israelites are allowed to return home. And then about around 400, you have the close of the Old Testament with the book of Malachi. So I hope that helps you out. Uh, again, a couple terms to keep in mind. Deuteronomistic history or Deuteronomistic cycle and also holy ban or ban. Keep those terms in mind. Read your uh, text. Read all the links in the modules. And um, you know, make sure you're getting your assignments in and done on time. 
啊 ，Good luck。